Genesis chapter 12. Uh, Genesis chapter 12, and, and, and actually, I didn't know, uh, I didn't know Phil was going to do that. Um, his, his song, in a lot of ways, follows very closely to what I, I want to share this morning and, and talk about, and that is, uh, how do we follow God in faith? How do we, how do we follow faithfully? And I want us to, to think about this this morning uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One, we've been talking a lot about faith in James, and James is about to move um, on to actions, actions that show, um, show, our, show our faith. But, but really, we, we just came to this passage last week about a faith that saves, a faith that works. Uh, uh, tell, don't just tell me about your faith, show me your faith. And with that and given things that have happened around here this week, um, I thought it would be a good message for us to think about faith and to think about how God calls us often deeper and deeper into faith, because that's what He does. That, that's what Phil's song, the, the heart of Phil's song. They didn't know what was going on. That wasn't their plan. But, but as Phil and Becca went through that process, what, what God showed Phil that, that He expressed in those, those beautiful words was that that, that God wasn't abandoning them. God was drawing them deeper to Himself. He was drawing them to a deeper po- place of faith. And this is what God often does in our life, and we don't like it. <laughs> because if God didn't initiate it, we wouldn't do it. And so, this morning, I want us to look at the call of Abraham and to think about the faith to follow, what it takes to have the faith to follow, and what it might be that, that God is showing us as a church, that He's calling us to a new season of faith, a new path to follow. Um, we're going to look at one of the greatest men of all the Bible, Abraham, if you've got Genesis chapter 12. Uh, Abraham is the, he is the hero of the Old Testament. He is really one of the most important figures of all of the Old Testament, and really all of the Bible is built upon Abraham, upon this initial call that we see in Genesis chapter 12. In fact, Jesus, when, when Jesus is introduced in the New Testament in Matthew, Matthew opens like this, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And, and that's just how paramount Abraham is in the Bible. This call, this initial call of, of Abraham, of of why it is so important, this chapter and, and these verses here in chapter 12 of Genesis. And I want to show us this today. I want us to look at, at Abraham because, again, one, Abraham is the example of a life of faith. Even as we looked last week in James, when James wants to talk about faith, he, he, says, he says, I'll show you what faith looks like. He says, remember Abraham. And he talks about Abraham and, and Isaac, but, but also throughout the New Testament, Abraham is often uh, referenced as an individual for faith, the individual to who we should look to for faith. In Hebrews 11, when the writer of Hebrews wants to talk about faith and give an example of faith, he spends the most time on Abraham. Jesus spoke of Abraham's faith. The apostles spoke of Abraham's faith. Paul, over and over again, speaks of Abraham's faith. This phrase throughout the Bible is repeated over and over again, Abraham believed God. And that's what faith is, isn't it? Abraham believed God. Faith is believing God. Not necessarily seeing what God is telling you, where God is leading you, what God has promised you, but it is believing God and taking the step to do what God has for you. That's what faith is, and Abraham is our premier example of faith throughout the Bible. And so it's always good for us to grow in our faith, amen? But more specifically, as I introduced to you last week, I believe that God has initiated a season of growth for this church. We have uh, discovered significant termite damage in the original church building, and we're going to have to do something. <laughs> it's not my timing. It's your, not your timing. Uh, I, called a, I called a friend of mine that's a pastor this week to, 
to, uh, to talk with him, and he said, uh, he said, Bob, you don't start a building campaign three months into a church. I said, I know, right? In fact, I made a deal with God. Because when, when I came, even through the search process, there was a lot of anticipation knowing that, that, that we, we need to do something with our facilities. And so even through the search process, the search team gave me plans that we had done in the past. They asked lots of questions about that. I came here. People got excited, right? God started to move. We've had an incredible season of ministry. People kept coming to me going, hey, what, we should we should do something. We should build something. We should do something, right? And, 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 and I, I went to the Lord, and I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. Uh, and, and so I prayed about it. I, I literally, I took a day and prayed about it because I was getting so much of this, and I just really didn't know, have an answer because I didn't feel like it was time. I, I don't know you yet. You don't fully know me yet. Let's not jump into something. And, uh, and, and so I prayed about it, and I said, all right, Lord, when we run... 400 for three consecutive Sundays, I'll start pulling the levers, right? We'll start talking about it. We'll start seeing what needs to happen. I made a deal with God, and I thought He agreed. <laughs> but that's not the way it works, is it? It's not necessarily on our timeline. It's not necessarily how we would plan it. That's not how faith happens. That's not how we grow. If, we, if, it, if it worked that way, it's us planning everything. It's us doing everything. It's us manipulating everything. But God has his own timeline. God has his own ways. And I want us to see here from the call of Abraham how often God works in our lives. Initially to call us to faith, but God also continues to call us to a deeper faith. And those moments, those situations, those things happen in our life, and they're not chance. It is a sovereign God who loves you, who knows you, who has a plan for you, and needs to get you somewhere that without a kick in the pants, you're not going to do on your own. Look with me, Genesis chapter 12. I'm going to read verses 1 through 9. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 9. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred, and your father's house, to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and for him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions, all that they had gathered, all the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. And when they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak at Morah, and, the time, and at the time Canaanites were in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country to the east of Bethel and pitched his tent. And with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going to, toward the Negev. What we see here, I want to show you three things about how God calls and how we respond, initially in faith, but ongoing in our life as we continue to grow in the Lord and, and the Lord continues to grow us. The first thing that we see in this text is God's call to faith, God's call to faith. In order to understand Abraham's life, we have to go back 40 centuries. We have to go back a time long ago, far ago, to a place called Ur of the Chaldees. Ur, right? Where are you from? Ur. Anybody from anybody here? Anybody here from South Carolina, uh, upstate South Carolina? They have a place on the map that's called G R E E R. You would look at it and say Greer, but that's not how you say it. It's called Grr, right? So every time I hear Ur, I think of Grr. <laughs> it was a very important city. 
It was on the banks of the Euphrates. In the ancient Near Eastern world, it was the center of, uh, of mathematics, astronomy, international commerce. It would have been like a, a Los Angeles or a New York or a Chicago of its day. It was a major hub. It was a, a place of great influence, a, a, great, a, a place of, of, of great wealth. It was also the center of pagan worship. Archaeologists have unearthed from that area that, that most of the homes that they find in the ancient area that was Ur, are, are, they, they find worship to a moon goddess. Later in the Bible, it will tell us that, that Abram's family, they were idol worshipers. They were pagan worshipers. There was nothing about Abraham. There's nothing about Abraham that earns God's favor. There is nothing to which, in fact, God will say this over and over again throughout the Old Testament, you were not a people, I made you a people. It's not that you sought after me. It's not that Abraham sought after me, but I sought after him. I called him. And that's what we see here. We see where this story begins that Abraham is 75 years old, about midlife of those days. He's prosperous. He's well-known. He's established. He has a household. He has many things. But God is looking for him because God wants to get him somewhere else. God wants to put his blessing upon him. God wants to work in him even though he's not looking to be at work for God. God wants to call him to faith. Above everything else, this text shows us how God works in our life and how God changes us when his call comes upon us. Again, there's the initial call unto salvation, but God doesn't stop there. If the only way that you say that God has put a call on your life is that you're following Jesus, God bless you. I love that. Praise God. But it means you haven't grown. It means you haven't continued to follow. God is at work in us. There's, there, there's, a, there's a, a, a phrase that I like. You know, God's doing a thousand things in my life right now. I'm aware of three. Isn't that what it feels like? Because that's how he is at work in us. Look again here at verse 1. Look, look at the call. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, from your kindred, from your father's house, to the land I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed." God finds Abraham while he is an idolater living in a pagan place. It's the most least likely person. And yet this man trusts God. He believes God. But the call comes from God. I want you to see that. The call comes from God. This was not Abraham's great idea. And the Bible frames this for us all the time. Uh, 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. John 6, 44, no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. John 3, 16, what's the nature of why salvation is available to us? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God is initiating there and working in us, and, and God's Spirit comes to us and reveals himself to us. The, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. We're, we're born again by the Spirit. God is at work. No one can stand and say, you know what, one day I just kind of got smart and, you know, I watched these Christians and I watched what they do. It looked pretty good. I, I weighed being a Christian versus not being a Christian. And, and you know what, I just kind of thought on my own and said, you know what, I'll just do that. No one is saved like that. God breaks into our hard-heartedness, our selfishness, our sin, and he shows us who he is. He shows us the glory of Christ. And when we see that and our heart is opened, we run. We embrace salvation and we follow. That's, that's the initial call. Did you notice Jesus in that passage? 
Now, his name's not there, but, but did, you, did you see Jesus as I read that passage? Look close at the last phrase. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. In the end, this is God's amazing plan for Abraham. He chooses him, and, and he tells him that, that all the nations will be blessed from this one middle-aged, childless man uh, who's a pagan worshiper in a culture full of people who don't know God. God is going to work through him that he would become a great nation and that of him all the nations would be blessed. Remember how Matthew introduces Jesus? The son of Abraham. The lineage traces all the way back to Father Abraham. Remember that song? Father Abraham. Yeah. Okay, Steve, we're good. <laughs> Steve's going to get up and start doing the, doing the motions, <laughs> right? We teach that song to our kids because it's true. Why is he our father? Why is it Father Abraham? Because God called him to that faith. And again, God calls us initially to faith. But God calls us to ongoing have a deeper faith. That's what we've been looking at as we've gone through James. Remember how James opened his letter? Uh, Listen, remember this. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that in the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. And if anyone lacks wisdom... Let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. God calls us not only to trust him initially, but he he calls us to continue to look to him as we meet various trials, as we come against different adversity, as different challenges come into our life. Why? Because God is working through those challenges very often to bring us to a new step in faith if we will acknowledge him and see how to follow him when those challenges come. Termites didn't catch God by surprise. And they caught us by surprise. And as we opened up those walls, let me just take a a moment and thank so many men in this church and thank Andre, Pastor. Yeah, you. He's shaking his head no, but he, is, he has worked so hard this week so that we've been able to, to open up and assess the damage and, and see what it is, that, that we've been able to, to move uh, offices so that we can keep going and, and move everything over here to this building so that we can begin the process that's going to take place. And we've had armies of men volunteer saving us thousands of dollars and moving us far, far ahead in the timeline to be able to reveal what the damage is. And so I just want to thank everyone. Let's give a hand to those... And I've had, I've had messages all week from, from men saying, I want to help, but I've also got to work. And, uh, and there'll be time. Don't worry. <laughs> this is going to be a season. But I do believe that God is calling us as a church to move forward in faith. God is, is calling us for, for years, again, as I, I said on the front end, for years, there's, we've known that that we want to do something, but we've not gotten together to move and to do it. And, and I, don't think that it's, uh, I don't think it's just by chance that God's timing is now. The damage that we've seen has been there for 14 years, at least. And God's hand has been protecting the, the facility that we've been able to use it that long. But, but I don't think that it is a uh, coincidence that right now, at this moment, after a major transition in the church, after a season of revival, after our community exploding all around us, I don't think that it's a coincidence that it's at this moment that God then presents us with a challenge where we are going to have to move by faith. Amen? I truly believe that this is a moment that God is calling us to as a church. And again, I am, 
I know I am very specifically applying this passage today. I hope you give me the grace to do that. We have such a need to to talk about this and understand it that that I think it warrants it. But there are other things in your life I'm sure that God is working in your life to see. I, I hope you can see from this any challenge, any opportunity, anything. When you meet various trials, God is working in you to shape you and to mold you more like Jesus Christ. And so what do we do? There's a call. How do we respond to God's call? Well, we have a faithful response is what we should do. That's what James has been talking about, right? As we've gone through James, don't just be hearers of the word, be doers, right? Show me your works, great. Or show me your faith, great. I'll show you my faith by my works, My faith has evidence because I I, I respond when I have faith, and that's what we're supposed to do. Faith that just says I have faith and has no evidence of anything happening is not faith. Do you get that? If Abraham said, if, if God called to Abraham and said, I need you to go, and Abraham says, that is an awesome word, thank you, God, and he stayed Would he be the hero of faith throughout the Bible? Would he be the example of faith? No. Now, it's interesting. You read this passage here, verses 1 through 3, and Abraham, he he doesn't understand the implication of what God has said to him. He he doesn't understand what specifically God wants from him. Just think about this. He, He says, go from the country and from your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. God comes to him. Again, for the first time we see here, leave your country, leave your people, leave your father's house, and go to a land that I'm going to show to you. Abraham was being asked to forsake everything to follow God's call. It was an act of faith for him to follow. Very much the same way, and in initial faith works in our lives. We, we hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. We hear that we're sinners, and we've sinned against God. And that, that because of that, God's punishment is due to us. We are law breakers. But God initiated a way that we could be saved in sending His Son, Jesus Christ, who, who came and lived a perfect life, who was rejected by His people, who taught of the kingdom of God, who gave an example of how to live without sin, who went to the cross, who died on the cross, and, and on the cross His death was not just It was not just that it was painful, but that he was taking our sin upon himself that we might be able to receive forgiveness and salvation if we would call and trust and follow him as our Lord. That's the initial call. When when that realization, when the power of the gospel, when that message is accompanied by, by the Holy Spirit in your life and it takes root and you understand that I need Jesus, I need to follow Jesus. That's the initial giving up of everything, to follow Him. Could you imagine, (laughs) imagine how this conversation might have taken place, right? Abraham comes to to God, or God comes to Abraham, and he says, uh, so I want you to leave everything. Everything? Everything, right? I I want you to go somewhere. Where? (laughs) You wouldn't believe me if I told you. How far is it? It's about 1,500 miles. What? 1,500 miles? Where where are you talking about? Uh, Canaan. I've never heard of it. I know. (laughs) I'm going to make you the father of a great nation. I don't have any kids. Now, God, listen. I know you created everything, but do you know how all this works? I'm getting up there in the age. It's all right, I got this. I I want you to go. I want you to travel to some place that you've never heard of to father a great nation. Is this some kind of a joke? No. What am I going to tell my wife? Eh, That's your problem. (laughs) I I, I want you to know that that when this call happened, Abraham did not have, he didn't have the Bible. (laughs) He didn't have a a reference of of all the things that we have when God calls us to follow him now. He just trusted. 
and he went. And he gave his life to go and to follow where God would call him. The truth is, God rarely gives you the full picture when he calls you to faith. When he calls you to move in faith, when, when, when a situation comes, you really don't understand the whole picture, even when it comes to your salvation, right? You might have an idea of what it is. You know eternally you will be secure, you will be in heaven, but do you guys really know what heaven's like? We got a few pictures of it. I'm talking with you later. <laughs> right? We know some things, but we don't know, no. In fact, the Bible tells us that it's going to be greater than anything you've ever heard. It's going to be greater than anything you've ever seen. It even says this, in in your most vivid imagination of the wonder and the beauty of what heaven will be like, you haven't even started to understand. And yet, we're willing to give everything, to follow Christ to be with him for all of eternity. So it also works in our life, you know. There's hard times that come, and, and you just kind of kind of work the process, right? You've just got to be faithful at that moment, at that step, at that thing. We could go through the room for the rest of the day and get testimonies from individuals of, of health issues, of financial needs, of family situations, uh, of, uh, of changes in, in, in their life and their desires. We, we could go for all day, I'm sure, hearing these testimonies of how God has placed a call upon our life to grow deeper in Him, to, to change something in our life, that God presents some kind of a change. And we've just got to take the next step and take the next step and take the next step because that's what faith is looks like. If you knew exactly what the end result was, that's no longer faith. Faith is trusting, trusting God that He loves us, that He'll lead us, and that He'll meet all of our needs no matter where it is that He calls us to go. We have a lot of questions ahead of us as a church as far as the best way to move forward with the damage to our facility. Uh, Questions are the only thing that I really have at this time. So you can ask them all day long, and I'll ask them back at you, because that's really all I got. I I told that that same friend this week, it's almost like COVID hit again, right? We just, we saw something, we had to react, we've moved offices, we begin to assess damage. Um, As far as what we do know, our next step is we're going to get a structural engineer to to look. We've we've revealed enough of the the damage that that we can get somebody in there now to to look at it, and they can tell us what what would have to happen for that to be be renovated, or if it's not even um, a possibility. And then we as a church need to, to work the process to, to begin to take the next step. And so here's, here's what I want to do to help lead in that next step is this. Next week, we're going to have a, uh, a regular business meeting, and I'm going to ask the church for, um, for us to allow for a, um, a work group, a, a special committee for developing a strategic ministry and facility plan. I'm going to ask you to do that, that we would ask the nominating committee to select who would be on that, and then we would have a special business meeting the next week, so that would be the 19th, where those names would be placed forward, and we as a church can discuss that and approve that so that we can have a team to begin to to pray and to look at those things and to filter in as as we hear things so that we can can then um, look at options and present those options to the church, and we can begin to decide what to move forward, what to do, what is it that God is calling us to do. But God is calling us to do something. That's obvious. The days ahead, I want you to know, will be days of great joy, but there'll also be days that there's going to be times that are trying. That's what happens when you move in faith. When you move in faith, the devil tries to make you move backwards every time. And so I'm under no illusion that, that we won't be, be di- distracted 
That's what the devil wants to do. The devil wants to distract us through this time. He wants to keep us from following God. He wants us to look inward. He wants us to think about buildings. He wants us to be overwhelmed. He wants us to think, what can we not do? Oh my goodness, why did this happen? But we need to be looking outward. We need to commit right now that that this is not going to keep us from doing ministry and mission. The Lord has been at work in this place. We have, we have baptized a record number of people for this church, and we are making connections into our community, and we are reaching more and more lost people. We are sharing the love of Jesus with, with more and more. We are meeting more needs. People are growing. People within this congregation are, are having personal revival and taking steps in their faith, and we're not going to slow that down. We're, we're going to move forward. And we're not going to let Satan cause us to look inward. We're going to look outward. As your pastor, I'm going with all my might to remind you to love one another, to stay on mission, to grow in faith, to move forward while we take the necessary steps to go, to identify and go where God is calling us. You know, you, you, when you called me here, I specifically said, you're calling me here to lead the ministry. You didn't call me to maintain the ministry. God is moving. We are going to follow. We're going to follow. Third thing I want you to see here. When when God calls us and we're faithful to follow, something amazing happens in our lives. We, We worship God calls us, and, and we follow, and we see God doing the things that he's, he's called us to do, the, the promises that he's made. We, we step out in faith, and as we step out in faith, and, and we see God work, it brings us to worship. It brings us to, to a deeper love and understanding of who God is, and a deeper love and expression of that. Look, look at verse 4. Abram went as the Lord had told him. He, he went. He moved. And Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 when he departed from Haran. Verse 5, he took Sarah, his wife, his brother, all their possessions, all they gather, all the people. When they came to the land of Canaan, okay, verse 6, Abram passed through the land at the place of Shechem, at the oak of Morah, and at the time the Canaanites were in the land, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your offspring I will give this land. So there he built an altar to the Lord. Who had first appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country to the east of Bethel, pitched his tent with Bethel on the west, Ai on the east, and there he built an altar to the Lord, and he called upon the name of the Lord. As Abram begins to take this journey, this very long, this very difficult journey, he comes into the land and it's interesting. Eventually he comes to the place of Shechem there within the, the promised land and and the Bible tells us that the Canaanites were in the land. And you would think that that would be a setback, right? God says, I'm going to give you this land. I'm going to call you this land. I'm going to give it to you. And, and there's people there, people that don't know God, people that don't worship God. And, and you would think that that would be a, a setback. And, and the reality of it is, is that although we move forward in faith, it doesn't mean that we're not going to meet adversity along the way. Sometimes we take an initial step of faith, and the first bit of resistance, we go, oh, well, we, maybe we shouldn't do that then. This is too hard. Here he comes into the land. He, he sees that the Canaanites are there, and he keeps going forward. God reveals himself. He reassures his promise to him. And what's his response? Worship. He builds an altar there. He worships the Lord there. He he continues to move through the land. As he continues to move through the land, he continues to worship. Friends, when when God places a challenge in your life, when, when God places an opportunity for you to grow in your faith, when God places an opportunity for you to trust and to move, don't do it without worshiping. Grow closer to God. It's really easy when a challenging time comes to get busy in the challenge. It it is. It's really easy to get distracted. It's really easy for even good things to take over our time and our thoughts and our energy and our efforts. But remember, 
fuel, the, the, the fuel for ministry is worship. And, and if you try to do ministry, if you try to move forward and, and you try to do it on your own, you empty the tank quick, don't you? And so here we see worship. I know we're very early in this process, but I, I want to challenge us to prayer. When you leave today in the foyer, as you go out on the, the little round tables, there's, there's, a, there's a, a sheet at each one. I thought I, had, I do have it. All right. Looks like this. It's laid out funny because I'm going to ask you to fold it yourself because I didn't have time to do that to all of them this morning. Put this in your Bible. Put this in your prayer closet. Keep this with you. For 30 days, it's just simple. A, a simple introduction to prayer and a, a, a simple Bible verse to meditate on and to think about how we move forward, what we do, how, how we need to stay unified, how we need God's wisdom, how we need to follow His calling together, that we together as a church can move forward through these next days as we begin to get answers and we begin to think about a plan. We need to do so together in prayer. Another way that we worship is through giving. Some of you have already asked, uh, Pastor Bob, can I start giving knowing that we're going to have to do something? Absolutely. <laughs> that is a wonderful idea. Many of you know we have uh, some funds for, uh, for a building. I don't, know, I don't know at this point how that's going to go, where that's going to go, but, but I can tell you that if you want to add to that, then you can. Begin to pray about how it is that, that the Lord can work in your life and in your finances that you can give. Maybe it's a one-time gift. Maybe you're beginning to think about how you can structure that, that you can give um, in a pledge format that, that we can continue to go. And those questions, we're going we're gonna to have to ask those questions at some time. What's God calling us to do? How are we going to do it? How are we going to work together to get there? What, how are we going to take the steps of faith that we need to go where God is leading I'm excited. This is not my plan. This is not my timing. But I'm excited to know that God is at work in us. This is not a dead, plateaued, dying church. This is a church that is very much alive, that is very much being obedient to the Word of the Lord and very much seeing God at work in us. I'm excited that God is going to push us to the next step, whatever that may be. Remember, God's first call for all of us is Christ. God's first call is to come to you and to reveal to you the gospel of Jesus Christ. Have you trusted in that? A lot of people try to follow God without first following Christ. They, they, they try to clean up their life or improve or do something that they know is wrong. They feel guilt or shame, and, and that's wonderful, but, but this isn't about self-effort. This is about trusting in God. This is about trusting in the way that God has led and has established, and He has sent His Son that we might receive salvation. Have you trusted in Him? That's the, the first and most important question that I could ask of you today in response to this. Have you, like Abraham, been far from God? It wasn't on your radar, but God has been at work in your life, and that Christ has revealed that He is your Lord and you are ready to follow Him. Perhaps that would mean in salvation to, to pray and ask to receive Christ as your Lord to follow Him. Maybe it's in baptism. We're going to see a, another baptism today. God is at work in this church. W whatever it is, have you trusted in Him? And then in your life, there are many ways that God calls us individually to deeper faith. There are many circumstances that happen. I, I, I haven't been here long, but I've already walked through things with many of you. There'll be many more that we'll walk through where we'll see situations where God calls us deeper and deeper. Are we willing to trust Him and to follow wherever it is that He would call? Maybe today you need prayer. Maybe today there is a situation in your life that you know that, that God is calling you to, and it's scary and you'd just like to pray with somebody about doing that. Maybe you would like to commit today. I'm going to do that thing. And then for all of us as a church, we have a season of faith ahead of us. It's a season of challenge. 
but it's a season that I'm excited as your pastor to help walk through with you that we might see God do incredible things. How many of us are here today because of steps of faith in the past that this church has made to expand the ministry, to, to make new opportunity, to, to create uh, a, a, an opportunity for more people to come and to gather and to be touched by the ministry of the church? And to know that God is doing that again is exciting. Whatever it is today, would you acknowledge God? Would you follow His call on your life?